Don Marin's collection. Don Marin was um, a resolute American businessman, a financier, who had an interest in uh, modern art from a very young age. And uh, he began collecting in a very large way, I guess when he was in his late 30s or 40s, mostly uh, American contemporary art, Johns, Rauschenberg, Ad Reinhardt, that sort of thing. When I was working for him, um, it was a combination of both modernist art and contemporary art. And so his modernist collection, things I got for him and a few things that he had before I began working for him included Leger, Picasso, lots of Matisse, Matisse cutouts. Uh, he was very fond of Kurt Schwitters and Cy Twombly. He also had works by Robert Ryman, Sam Francis, uh, Liechtenstein, Gerhard so Richter, more Matisse, Matisse drawings. I mean, what was his idea about purchasing art? What was his idea? Well, what the dominant feature in the way he collected art, and this is the thing for which I respected him absolutely the most, is he had a very good sense of what he liked. And what he liked was immediacy, um, art that struck one visually uh, immediately. So that tended to be things of high chromatic value, uh, like the Picassos that he had, uh, wildly colorful, Matisse, certainly, Richter, absolutely. Um, uh, and that, had to, that, had, that was the primary concern, the Twombly's that he had. They had to strike one immediately. So that meant usually these were highly gestural things and or highly chromatic. So they struck one on an almost kind of animal level or a, a chromatic level before one could think about even who made it. It was okay. the immediacy, you see? And that, the, the things I just described, I should have mentioned Picasso also, those were things at his home. Um, things at the office, in his offices, were a bit more wide ranging and somewhat more experimental. He was more willing to take a risk on things he didn't know as well or was somewhat more uncertain about, but also well-recognized things. So it was everything from Christian Markley to Ed Ruscha to Mark Bradford, for example, or Lee to Koenig, Jonas Woods, so there was some very contemporary things along with, you know, well-recognized blue chip contemporary artists as well, so-called contemporary artists. What they all had in common, I would say 90% of them, was the same thing, uh, often large scale, immediately visually apprehendable, high chromatic presentations. Most of it abstract or tending towards abstraction. Um, mostly American or Western, shall we say. Um, it did include photographs and prints and drawings, but his primary focus and that which I uh, helped him find was paintings. From the collection sold by the two, the three dealers, what was the main names that you are very proud of? Uh, well, Picasso, de Kooning, Richter, Twombly, Boucher <laughs> was his name, <laughs> Rothko, um, yeah. Not yeah. bad, huh? Yeah, yeah, and um, it's bittersweet because um, every single work, for the most part, was bought shortly after it was made. There was the de Kooning, a couple of de Koonings, of course, but um, Bradford, Groschen, Kelly, Bryce Martin. Um, these things were all bought shortly after they were made. In some cases, we had entered into agreements to acquire them before they were finished. Oh, uh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Martin, Bradford, um, Jonas Wood. Uh, sorry, um, 
uh, Mark, Mark Grouchen. When he passed away, originally the presumption is that the works would go to auction. Um, Mark Glimpshire uh, mentioned he had this idea. He was very uh, charming about it, Mark. He said, Matthew, what would you think of an idea that would lead me into business with somebody with whom I never do business? He meant Larry. Um, and uh, he and Larry then, I presume, talked, and they, they discussed collecting their resources with Bill Aquavella to acquire all of Don's collection. All of it? Well, not all of it, because the family retained some things. Um, but the three galleries together uh, acquired the collection. And then through their various uh, means, they thereafter very quickly, wildly successfully, wildly successfully uh, sold, sold it. How many pieces? How many pieces work? How uh, many pieces were sold by the free galleries? I don't know. They were, um, I, I worked with them in many respects, but I never asked and they never volunteered to say, uh, to, talk, to talk about it in that way, how many pieces. Um, I, I do know that m most of what they needed to sell, they sold. And uh, do, do we have an idea of how many pieces there were in the collection? Well, in the collection that they bought, I would assume, I don't know, 160, something like that. I don't know. But the, the personal collection of Donald Mahon was really larger, right? Yeah, as I said, the family did retain some things as well. So do we have an idea of the, of the, the importance of the collection? Monetarily or number-wise? Number-wise. I would say over 200 things. And the, the corporate collection, even if he didn't like you to speak about corporate, the corporate collection, collection stayed with the, with the company? Hmm. The, everything was owned by Donald Marin. You said uh, that he, he, he he made, uh, he was kind of nostalgic and he said that uh, before it was the art world and it became the art market. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, Don was uh, wildly admirable in my eyes at least because his connections within the art world were based predominantly on, I know it sounds corny and probably not credible, <laughs> but it was based on his personal connections within the art world and his immediate responses to the art objects. He rarely bought because he thought it was going to be more, worth more money. He didn't buy things and turn around and sell them when it was worth more money. Um, he, he was not distrustful of, but he was wary of <clears throat> collectors, whatever their collection, if they didn't seem to know much about the artworks themselves. Um, he really did believe in, in the cultural aspect of of the artwork and he was never explicit, but I always got the impression that like many of us, he saw some of the inroads being made by vast amounts of money as corrosive uh, within the sphere of culture, within the world of um, painting, well, a fine art, shall we say. And, you know, nobody does just one or the other. Sometimes I was able to campaign for works like Mark Bradford, for example, he was, he had to be led into that. Well, he became a very uh, vocal enthusiast, Don was, for works of Mark Bradford. Why, why do you think Mark Bradford is important? Why do I say what? Why do you think Mark, Mark Bradford is important? I think he's supremely important, um, but on a lot of different levels. Um, first of all, his visual language is entirely unique. That nobody does what he does. It is rooted in the most fundamental kind of biography. 
you know, childhood biography, the bits, the scraps, the discarded aspects of things, the detritus that's found as the building block of not only a new chromatic language, uh, but a, a, a whole new visual language, a whole new way to represent himself, his past, his community, and given his foundation and the way he has used his own success to, to recreate or to rebuild um, the community in which he lives. Um, so he's uh, fantastically important on a social level, um, but the artwork he's, he, he makes himself is, um, is so significant. I, the best paint, the best work of art, or certainly one of the best works of art I've seen in 10 years, uh, certainly the most emotionally striking work I've seen by any American painter in the past 15 years, it was in Los, is, is, is in Los Angeles. It's um, a large mural one sees as one goes into LACMA. Yes, I've seen it. It's huge. It's called 150 Tone Marker, I believe. And huge, it's huge, right? Over, sorry? It belongs to the collection and it's gigantic. It's gigantic. It's from 2017, I think. Okay. Um, and it's both a portrait, if you will, uh, and it's high abstraction. It's got links to California word art, for example. Um, and it is the transcribed uh, language, the dialogue a young woman made seconds after her boyfriend had been shot to death by a police officer. And it is her words given to the police dispatcher to the cop that shot this boyfriend of hers and to the man himself as he was dying. It's without any judgment, without any hysteria, it's just words. So it is both distanced and, and using fact for an almost overpowering, uh, overpowering uh, emotional effect. And concretely, it means that uh, you, you, you introduce him to the work of Mark Bradford and you you have bought uh, several Bradford together? Yeah, yeah. One was found in London through White Cube. One we acquired through, uh, two of them we acquired through Hauser and Worth. And, you know, given how um, enormously sought after Bradford is, you know, it's, an under, it's, it's a joyful undertaking because he's, he's a very kind man, Bradford is. What, what did he, what the, what was the consequences of this friendship? You bought several work from from him. What does it mean? Well, the most concrete aspect of it was we got three outstanding paintings. And both, all of them has been sold. Uh, yes. So why do you think Jonas Wood is important? Uh, I didn't say that. You did. No, but you. Uh, my, I presume that you advise art to be bought, which is important, no? So you didn't advise him to buy Jonas Wood? Oh, no, no, I did, I did. Um, um, I was just having fun with you, Judith. Um, <laughs> Jonas Wood, uh, what are you asking? Do I think he's significant as a painter? Uh, the work that we acquired, that Donald acquired, uh, is a very large still life, which incorporated uh, several autobiographical um, objects within it. And it is a sort of celebration of the workplace, if you will, because it's a painting of his studio, of the things in his studio. And uh, I, we bought it, I bought it uh, standing in his studio. Um, and Don always liked pictures of studios and it's rare to see I'm sure other such things have been done recently. Nothing comes to mind. And I, I knew that Don would like it too. It seemed fresh because it's the sort of thing that no one is doing or had done. Um, we almost, I remember seeing a series of tennis courts that uh, Jonas painted through Anton Kern some years earlier. And Don- uh, So you don't answer my question. Huh? Why is it pertinent? Well, to the extent that people are 
absorbed by objects uh, or, 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 or of uh, apprehendable subject matter, not abstraction. Um, you know, I don't know anyone else who has achieved the kind of success that he has. But um, Jonas Wood is a fashionable painter today, no? Well, uh, Joshua Reynolds was fashionable in the 18th century. Who? Exactly. Uh, there are a lot of people who are fashionable. Yes, but you seem uh, a wise advisor. So I'm asking you about the effect of fashion or not. Do you, do you care for that when you advise someone? One should, one should always be careful with fashion, yes. If we speak about some uh, artists en vogue today who are... Right. Figuring. Well, you mean like, I mean, there are numbers of them, like Nijideke and Akonini Crosby, for example. Uh, um, I was uh, lucky enough in October to be in London, strangely enough, and I saw paintings by somebody I'd never really heard of much before, who apparently is also immediately popular, named Lynette uh, Gaedon Bovakie. And she has a retrospective at the Tate now. Yeah, like out of nowhere almost. For, uh, for America. Part of the problem with that kind of success, it seems to me, is that people look at the success rather than at the artwork. Do you, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but it often happens. And it's often very dangerous because people begin to look for the cracks or the fissures in it. I mean, she's a brilliant uh, paint handler. She's got these closely valued tones that remind me, uh, you know, of, Akins or somebody like that. And uh, they are imaginary portraits, I think they're called. They're not yeah. of real people, that they're the conglomerations of perceptions of people. And they're often doing things that are not quote unquote important. They're standing around smoking a cigarette. They're standing in the wings. They're taking a rest. And, um, and uh, as a result, this kind of um, uh, dark, closely valued handling of things of not terrible importance are made significant to me. So I, again, when you see something and you feel like you've discovered something, or I do at least, I always feel sort of like I've discovered it. And then to, to, to learn that it's not only been seen by others, but it's been celebrated and it's now in museum collections. It's a curious, um, I mean, I sort of want to feel like I should congratulate myself for having noticed it. But then I, you know, you often distrust success, that kind of immediate nature, because it is immediately absorbed by a marketplace, which thinks in terms of money. But um, what do you think of the situation of this, the art market in this very special period? Oh, that's a terrific question. And I wish I had a better grasp of this. Um, I mean, people are obviously absolutely wild to connect with art. The, the number of people that have gone online to look at it is extraordinary. I don't quite know what to make of the auction numbers that have come in because I, I don't know how well they're doing. I don't know if people are retaining great works of art until this is all over. I don't know. I know that people with lots of money are looking for bargains, but I don't know if they're finding them. Um, I don't know if great works of genius are coming onto the market right now. Do you think we're not seeing as much? But do you think it's a time for bargain? No, I said people who have lots of money would love to find something which they presume uh, the asking price for which they assume is a lot less than it would have been six well a year ago, uh, and that they they presume that people are desperate to sell things off to turn their art into money. The problem is that lots of people with lots of great art collections, if they can, uh, are holding on to them as much as they can. So a lot of things are not coming to market just now. But people's need to, the craving that people are now having to look at art, to know about art, is, is extraordinary, it seems to me. And so in the new generation, what are the artists you are looking at? Oh, Lord. well, as I said, and I don't think you believe me, but I, I believe that much of the most interesting work being done right now is in variations in portraiture. And 
Some of this portraiture is what they're calling imaginary portraiture. Much of it is fusions of antique or romantic portraiture with contemporary sensibility. Some of it's through mixed media. Um, so what do you think about? What do I think about portraiture? Yeah, what, give me some name of artists. Um, I like this guy, Thomas J. Price. Do you know him? No. Um, very uh, uh, intelligent art, fuses almost like antique, he's a sculptor, um, antique prototypes with extremely contemporary things. It's a bit like um, Ying, uh, uh, Gehenda Weiling, but okay. fusing old, well-established traditional motifs and then shooting them through with something uh, unexpected and highly, um, I wouldn't say contradictory, but uh, highly, uh, anything unlike, I mean, when I look at a Ken ha Kehinda Wiley portrait, I think of somebody like Gainsborough rather than Mel Ramos when it comes to coloration. <laughs> and the fusion, the, the contradiction is extremely exciting, but often, you know, it hides the fact that the guy is very, very intelligent. Um, and that is, is fast. I, I can't wait to see what he does next because I think he is that important. Très bien. Bon, merci beaucoup, monsieur. À vous. Thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.